there. Welcome to Cageless, a conversation podcast about experiential wisdom and personal hope. I'm Jenny Johnson. I'm a writer, and I'm asking experts, thought leaders, and my friends to share their knowledge and tools on how they found freedom. Welcome to season one. Today, our guest is an internet big sister, a professional pep talker, a paradigm shifter, if you will. Uh, She has been featured in Cosmo, Refinery29, Stylist Magazine, and if I had to guess, probably your For You page. This is Frankie Simmons. Hi, Frankie. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited to have you on. Tell me, where are you today? I am in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, in my home, sitting in my office, like I do most of the time, just chilling out. Um, Let me start where I think is always the best place, which is the beginning. So can you give me and everyone listening kind of a 50,000 view perspective on your life? Oof, yeah. So my life um, has been honestly, just a a really weird unraveling of like so many different identities. I grew up in a community where I had an identity pretty much like ready-made handed to me. I grew up in a very like fundamentalist, Christian, conservative bubble. I was homeschooled. I like took classes at the church that we went to. So just like everything in my world revolved around this um, very like strict, rigid set of like morals and rules and who you're going to be and how you're going to grow up and what you're going to do when you grow up. Um, And I lived that life for, you know, the first 18 years of my life. I was um, very deeply involved in that church. Um, Really, we left that church and moved to a different one when I was like 16. And it was the most like devastating thing because I, my whole life was like, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to go to this church. I'm going to meet a guy at this church. I'm going to get married in this church. Our babies will go to this church. Like it was all like revolving around this like tiny little church that met in a strip mall. Like it wasn't even anything big, but it was like my whole world. And um, yeah. And then when I went to college, I ended up still was like very involved in the Baptist student ministries, but I ended up getting really, really sick. So I got into like a pretty toxic relationship out there. I started a pretty toxic job, like just had like a convert, a converging of like a lot of like not great things. And um, my body was just like, I'm out. I can't handle this. This has been a very stressful life so far. And we're just going to like try to bench you. And so um, I got mono when I was 19 and just like never got better. It just like kept turning into a bunch of different things. And so because I was super thick, um, I had to drop out of school my sophomore year, had no idea what I was doing with my life and then ended up just kind of like entering uh, the world of marketing. <laughs> got a job at like some random like place that just needed somebody to run their social media Um, and was still just like super sick, was still just struggling so much with my mental health, was just basically just setting myself up for a life of like, everything is going to hurt a lot, probably forever. And that's just going to be the way that it is. And the moment that I decided that I wanted to maybe quit my job, I got fired. So it was perfect. I didn't even have to do that. (laughs) Um, And I just started doing some like freelance marketing stuff, just basically taking what I had been doing um, and doing it just for myself on a contract basis. And starting that business really just launched me into a lot of having to examine all of the things that I had learned to believe about myself and about the world, because it was really the first thing that I had done of my own choice that wasn't just what was expected and what like felt like the next step and what was handed to me. And so, um, and plus it was like starting a business, which really just like requires you to step into like more confidence, your worth, like all of this stuff that I had just like never had to look at before. The the chronic illness that I thought I would have forever um, within like two months of starting this like really big healing journey, those symptoms just like disappeared and have never come back. And it basically everything just continued to open up from there. And so ended up continuing to do some marketing stuff until um, entrepreneurs were like, hey, you've been running a business for a year and you actually seem like you're doing better and all of us are dying. Is there anything you can share about like what that's looked like for you? And I started kind of like helping other business owners build businesses that maybe just like didn't kill them. Um, and then 
basically I've just continued adding like things to my skill set and like trainings and experience of like just a bunch of different ways to like help people do what they're here to do and be who they're here to be and redefine their life on their terms and and do some of the like self-discovery work that I got to do that changed everything for me and it's just kind of like continued to expand from there so now I do a lot of like coaching work um and energy work and like social media sharing from there and um and it just kind of continues to transform so yeah that was like a speed run through the last forever but (laughs) it was so good oh my gosh that was so good if you're listening to this you've probably seen one of frankie's videos (laughs) she is so eloquent in the way that she speaks and also just so um accurate like everything that she says is just so accurate which is why i think that people relate to you so much that you can really articulate what you're wanting to say and 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 your stories behind what you want to say okay so backtracking just a little bit it, it is a preconceived notion that i am also from southern conservative roots um also from uh you know a previous religious background that i have very much deconstructed and reconstructed on my own terms I am a seminary dropout, and uh, I am still a self-proclaimed Christian. But the thing is, is, is I think something that's so cool about Frankie is that she chooses, she doesn't tell anyone what to do. She, like, doesn't assert her own agenda onto other people, which I think is what creates such a safe space. And so, Frankie, can you tell us a little bit about what what were you forced upon like can you tell us Mm -hmm. what your specific belief system was and when you Mm kind of recognize that it was like I was being told to believe this this isn't actually what I think I believe yeah definitely so the process of well first the the faith framework that I was handed growing up was um Calvinist for like anybody who's uh like into the the different nuances of what Christian theology looks like. And Calvinism is, I always call it like the facts don't care about your feelings sect of Baptists, because it's very much like, yeah, like this is what the Bible says. Don't worry about how you feel about it. Um, My upbringing was very like three hour sermons. And it it was a very like, uh, there wasn't a lot of heart in the way that Christianity was practiced um, around me. I remember being told like from the pulpit that like the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to um, people anymore. Like that was just a Bible thing. And now we have the Bible. And so like, you really don't need to worry about like hearing God's voice or like, you know, miracles don't happen. Like we just have the Bible and we just have to study the Bible. And so everything was just like this very like heady theological um just like study thing and how you were feeling was at best irrelevant and at worst like very distrusted um which was when i look back at like what i think really caused like the chronic illness and like all of the different things that ended up happening in my body um when it did finally break down i just i kind of go back to that and this like divorce that happened mm-hmm. from like what you are experiencing and what you are being asked to devote your life to. Like that there's just like no room for you to have your own feelings, your own experience, um, like anything that is not just like doing what you are told and being who you're supposed to be, is just like, doesn't actually matter. And so there was just so much of me and like who I am that got just like shoved off to the side. And you can't do that without there being like collateral damage um, in your body and in your spirit. And so continued practicing that. What really I think broke things for me was I remember very vividly, there was like one specific night um, where I was just sitting on my bed and I just kind of realized like how I had never been taught to ask honest questions. Like growing up Christian, you're taught like, you know, you're going to have doubts and you're going to have questions and that's part of the process. But like, you're taught to ask the questions like starting from three steps in, like everybody who asks a question is like, I know that this is true. And I know that God is real. And I know that he loves this. And I know that he hates this. I'm like having trouble with this one part of this. Like, can you help me not have trouble with it anymore? Which is not actually like giving space to your doubt or being allowed to ask an actual question. It's like, yeah, it's a question that started with a lot of assumptions and assuming an end goal already before you even start. And I remember sitting there and just being like, I think if God is who I've always 
believed he is, like, he's not scared by the fact that sometimes I want to, like, actually ask these questions. I think that if this is actually true, then it's going to hold up to me actually inspecting it. Um, And so I just started to look at, like, all of these things that I had always wondered about and, like, always struggled with, but just been like, well, that's the way it is. And what I ended up finding out was just like how many different schools of thought there are within the Christian faith around all of these things. And that alone was enough to like break everything for me because I was like, I've been taught that like, this is the truth. And anybody who believes anything differently is lying to themselves. And here are all these people that like have devoted their lives to the scripture and like love God and like love Christianity and have come down on very different sides on these issues. Why was I never taught that there were even like any other options to believe if you're going to call yourself a Christian? And that for me was like, mm-hmm. I can't do this anymore. You know, like if there, if, if I'm going to walk around telling people that they're going to hell and going to be burned forever for like being who they are, then like, I better be damn sure. Like I need to like know for certain that that's the case if I'm going to walk around making that my life's work. And so that really like blew the roof off of everything for me. And since then it really has just been a practice of like curiosity, like has been the biggest thing for me is just having space. Um, It's just felt like getting introduced to a buffet after a lifetime of only eating oatmeal, like being allowed to just like ask the questions and pick and choose and like see what other faiths have to say about certain things. It just has been like so um, enlivening and beautiful to like just have the space to see in different colors than I was ever allowed to before. I think of this quote that uh, in terms of spiritual formation, first of all, I, I believe that all humans on this earth are of inherent worth and value and we all have souls and we all want love. I am bold enough to make that claim. Even the 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 person who is the most pessimistic, angry person, you still want to be loved, babe. Mm-hmm. Like you, you want to be loved. Um, you know, when you're young, you uh you learn to wrestle with the devil, mm-hmm. and the older you get, you learn that you actually just want to wrestle with God. And it's it's more about looking at the source and like looking at, you know, if if you want to use Christian terms, your father and like understanding that like he's strong enough to to stand up to whatever questions that you have. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, your your mind and your body are one like your mind, your body, your spirit. No one on this earth is is negated from any type of pain. So when you say that you were suffering from chronic illness, can you walk us through a little bit of that experience? Yeah. So my chronic illness um, started with a what was not supposed to be a chronic illness. It was like summer. um uh, after my freshman year, I got mono. Um, and it was I was very chill about it. I was like, okay, you know, this is something people get. It's very common and we're just going to get over it. And basically then just spent the whole summer sick. Finally started feeling better as I was like heading back to school. And then I, I remember like this specific day, it was like October and I was like sitting in my dorm room at school and I just started, I was like feeling super tired. And I remember like reaching under, it sounds super weird, but like under my armpit and like my lymph nodes were super swollen. And I was like, oh, because that had always been like a sign of like, that was one of the main symptoms that I had had during mono. And um, I just thought that, you know, sometimes motto sticks around and like, whatever, it sometimes takes a little while to get over and just didn't really think that much of it. But like that whole, like first semester of sophomore year, I like, I fell asleep in every single movie I watched for like first semester of sophomore year. Like I, I did not make it to the end of any movie. I would fall asleep as soon as I sat down. I was like sleeping through classes, which is like very unlike me, mm. um, was just like exhausted and I had just like no energy for anything. Um, my mental health was also just like in the like can, it was just terrible. And so I was like just a walking ball of stress and exhaustion and had like no appetite, lost a bunch of weight. Like it was just not great. Um, And so I took a medical leave of absence um, from my school for like one semester. Um, I was also like, at that point was like, I don't really know what I'm doing in school. I feel like I'm just here because I'm supposed to be like, what am I even studying to do? And so I was a little bit relieved to have like the space to try and figure out like what I actually wanted. Um, And I went home and 
moved back in with my parents. I had no idea what I was doing, um, but just kind of like stayed sick for a while and continued to test positive for like active mono for like years. Um, like mm. it just never went pa- like never went like into its passive state as it does for most people. And then that just kind of turned into a bunch of different things. So I started having a lot of nerve pain. It turned into like a lot of uh, just like fibromyalgia syndrome. Um, and I, yeah, just for about four years was just kind of dealing with that. Like just everything hurt all the time and was just like really tired constantly and had like no, um, yeah, no like energy to do anything. Um, and went to all the doctors and did like so many things. And it was just like such a hassle. Like traditional med- like traditional medicine doctors. I did traditional medicine doctors and also like a lot of holistic things. So I was like paleo for a long time and did like candida cleanses. And I did like infusions where they would like hook me up to an IV machine and like pump a bunch of stuff through me for an hour and a half. And like, it was gnarly. Um, but yeah, I, and I remember um, when we yeah I just was like the thing that I wanted most of all was just like get to go hiking (laughs) because like it was just that was like I I just like really missed getting to go out and like move my body without being like afraid of what that was going to do to me the next day um and I remember in like April of 2018 I booked a trip to Iceland with some of my friends and they were all talking about going on this glacier hike and I was like okay like y'all will leave me with a car. Like I'll go do a bunch of other stuff that day because like, there is absolutely no way I can hike in a glacier in Iceland. And then April of 2018 was when like everything kind of started healing. And by September, when we went on that trip, I got to the top of that glacier and it was like a really, really big, beautiful moment um, because I wasn't hurting anymore. So yeah, yeah. man. And also just like, ah, what a freaking metaphor. Like you cannot, yeah, I could not write one better myself of like, (laughs) Being able to say, like, I feel all of this pain in my body and I also feel it in my mind. How Mm -hmm. am I going to get out of this, like, cage? Like, how am I going to get out of all of this, like, boxed-in pain? Mm -hmm. So the the question that we're all dying to know is what was your first step? Yeah. So I – started talking to this uh mentor who it actually is incredibly magical she was like she's a life coach and energy worker um who is the older sister of like one of my very best friends and i remember when i first met my friend and like heard about what her sister did i thought it was the most ridiculous thing i was like oh you just you live in california and you do like life coaching for people like that's so silly um it just felt like the biggest like non-job ever um but then when i started um I had like met her and obviously because we were like just just friends of the family and stuff and I would we were friends on Facebook and I would see her posts and stuff and when I started my business you know she was somebody who like had started a business and was doing it successfully and she would talk a lot about like the mindsets of having a successful business and like what you need to like believe and step into to be able to like you know feel comfortable like asking people for money for your services and stuff and so um so I reached out to her just to see like if she could help me build my business. And we had a conversation and it was really um, just this, I just felt like so understood and so like cared for and just it was really beautiful. And so I, I hired her for like a coaching package and we get in the first session and she goes, so I know you wanted to work on your business, but like, you're really sick. Like, would you like to do something about this? And I was like, no, like I, I don't, like I've done all the things, like I'm just gonna be sick forever. I just would like to have enough money to take care of myself while I'm sick. Like, I like, don't Mm. worry about that. It's whatever it hurts. It's fine. Like, I just want to build this business. She was like, okay, that's fine. But like, let's talk about that. Maybe you can't. (laughs) Yeah. She was like, just just go with me here. And I was like, okay, fine. Like, this is a complete waste of time. Like nothing is going to change on this front. Um, And we really just were talking about, you know, obviously she's not a doctor and she wasn't claiming, she wasn't like trying to cure me of anything, but she was really just talking about like, what were the, like the mindsets and the things that you picked up from being sick for this long? Like that obviously has to change, like kind of your relationship with yourself. What does that look like? Mm. And we started digging into everything and really just, um, came down to this like core belief that I had carried for so long that if I'm not like actively being good to other people, then I'm nothing like, because so much of Christian life is just about service and what you can do for other people. And, 
Um, and so it was this, this belief that like, I don't have any like real inherent value. It's just like what I can do for other people. And it's like the highest level of codependency possible. Yeah, basically. But codependency was just like everybody all the time. <laughs> like yeah. there's just yep. nothing else about you that even matters. Um, and you know, that had just created a space where I didn't have any personal autonomy. You know, I couldn't say no to anything or anybody. I couldn't like take care of myself or my space or my time. And so this illness was a very functional way for me to be able to rest. Because if I Whoa. could say like, if I could say, hey, I can't show up for that thing because it might put me in the hospital, like that's allowed. If I say like, hey, I physically can't get out of bed today, that's an okay reason for me to say no. And so it actually as much as it was something that had caused me so much stress and so much pain and taken so much for me, it was also something that I was relying on in a very real way because it gave me a sense of self for the first time. Your, your body was literally tapping out. It was mm -hmm. saying like, yo, like you, you, you literally can't show up for anyone else. You only can show up for me. Otherwise you die. Precisely. Yeah. And it was like, Hey, you don't have any way to protect yourself. So like, I'm going to do what I can to make sure that you actually like, listen and yeah and like don't kill yourself um wow yeah which is like something that every time still to this day when I think about it for too long I just like start bawling because it just like mm. the the lengths that my body went to and the amount that she like put herself through to protect me when I like mm -hmm. did not give a shit about her like did not care um it just it's I'm like very very grateful um and yeah. So we started digging into that belief and she, like I said, was an energy worker and she had a process of like subconscious, like uh, belief shifting um, that basically was like, you kind of find this one belief and then you go through a process of just like kind of getting into like all the spaces in your mind and in your energy where this belief hangs out and just kind of like cleaning it up. Um, and by the end of the process, I wasn't sick anymore. Um, and then wow. like a month after that also got to start like weaning myself off of like psychiatric meds, which so grateful for those meds would be still on them if I needed to. No problem with that. But also like um, just also shifted my mental health in a really big way as well. Yeah. So to get a little a little vulnerable here, what have as if we're not always vulnerable, um, <laughs> what has been your experience with kind of deconstructing your core beliefs? What are a few values that you feel like were integrated into you that you have had to kind of face at like face head first and deconstruct mm -hmm. and and yeah yeah I think the biggest value um that I have definitely spent a lot of time deconstructing is this like really just like the the core of who I am being allowed to be good um because like the the whole like christian framework as it's taught to us in like evangelical western churches is like you're wrong and if you work really really hard your whole life and spend like everything you have trying not to be who you are then maybe you'll be accepted and you'll be loved and you'll be happy and you won't like burn forever and that for me has been just like completely flipped on its head to like I'm completely right. And the world has put a lot of resources into trying to like make me who I am not. And now the process that I get to spend my whole life doing is coming back to who I already naturally was in the first place. And like just peeling back all the layers that were put on top mm -hmm. of the rightness that I already was this whole time. Mm -hmm. So it's like a complete like 180 yeah. on the like sense of self mm -hmm. and also just the sense of like what it means to be in progress, what it means to be growing, like what is self-improvement, you know, like just mm -hmm. uh, really redefining a lot of terms for myself just in like that one thing changing. Right. Which to you, what is self-love? To me, self-love is the space to be present with who I am exactly as I am in this moment and to believe that it's all perfect and it's all right. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the first time somebody looked at me and they were like, however you are feeling in this moment is the correct way for you to feel. And I was like, that's dumb. Like, sometimes I feel selfish. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like petty and lazy. Sometimes like, you know, there's like so many ways that I could feel that don't feel like the right way to feel. Mm -hmm. exact In fact, there's like only a very small percentage of feelings that exist that feel like they could possibly be correct at all. Mm -hmm. um, but 
it really is true. Like, however I am feeling makes sense Mm -hmm. and is the right way for me to feel right now. And when I give myself the space for that and I lean into like whatever is present for me in this moment and look to find the reasons why it is actually good, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that I like trust those feelings immediately or like I give them the reins to like, you know, ruin my whole life or like do whatever they want to do. Like there are questions that I ask of them and there's care that I give to them. But like, there's also a level of like, just core belief of like, if you're here, you're here for a reason. And I'm going to take time to figure out what that is before I just assume that I need to fix you. Mm -hmm. And that's been the biggest practice of Mm self-love for me, for sure. Oh, I love that. There is, um, there's a podcast that I love listening to by, uh, the Harvard professor, Arthur Brooks, who he's a writer for the Atlantic as well. But the podcast that he runs, uh, is called the art of happiness. And, he mm. loves to framework um, kind of like life in general as a working science experiment. And I love that because we never run a science experiment or actually I never do because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> contemplative creative writer. So I don't run science experiments ever except for in the kitchen and sometimes those do go badly. But the thing is, is you never run a science experiment and yell at a peach tree dish you were never going to like mm-hmm. scream at a chemical or like ask it like to do something that it just isn't capable of doing. So why do we do that to ourselves? Like why mm-hmm. do we not look at each experience as a learning opportunity to just test a new hypothesis, right? We have lived in a culture and a lot of us have been relicked with some sort of Western um, ideal whether that's consumerism, whether that's perfectionism, whether that's a type of religion, that like you're wrong or that you are not allowed to be something. And because you are not allowed to be that, you're bad. Like it's mm-hmm. it's the it's the good and the bad when in when in reality, there is no good and bad. Like there is a helpful and harmful I would, I mean, there are things that I'm not going to sit here and tell you to like go do really illegal drugs and hurt yourself and people that would hurt. That would, I would call that bad. Um, But at the end of the day, we are choosing to like, to, to call from the inside of the house, right? Like we are choosing Mm -hmm. to beat ourselves up for things, for just being, we're getting so heady here. (laughs) <laughs> and there's no reason. There's really no reason. And it's not even – it's not productive, I have found. In fact, it can be really harmful. And especially in your experience, it it literally hindered your life. Like it literally hindered mm-hmm. your body. Um, okay, so so stepping forward just a little bit, after you had like kind of this this recollection of like, oh, like – I can heal myself from the inside out just by asking really good questions. How has, how have things changed for you in your day-to-day life? Mm. Things in my day-to-day life definitely look like pretty unrecognizable from where they were before. I mean, just like from the, the like waking up with like enough energy to make it through a day and with like a body that Mm. isn't in pain all the time, like that on its own obviously makes like a gigantic difference. Um, But also like, I think there's just so much more um, peace within myself Mm. from this like knowledge of like, it is, it is good for me to be good to myself. Like it is, Mm. it is actually the right thing for me to do to invest resources and time in like my own experience and my own joy and my own like peace and happiness and whatever else Mm. I would possibly want in this world. Like Mm -hmm. that's such a huge deal just from the space of like going from, the pinnacle of what I could be doing is like dying to myself and being for other people to like being allowed to build a world that actually revolves around me is so different. Um, And yeah, I have been able to like build the business of my dreams where I get to spend like work from home um, and spend my time talking to like the best people in the world and like create um, a job for myself that actually like feels really good. And that's been a really big deal. Um, But also just like the way that I interact with that, like has shifted a lot to it just nothing has the nothing has the power to make me feel 
wrong about myself. You know, it's, Mm. there is not this one metric outside of myself that like, if I'm doing this and this, then I'm good. And if I'm not doing this and this, then I'm bad. If I'm not like making this much money or doing this thing or spending this time, like for other people, I get to define for myself, like just what I want and then make that what I'm moving towards from an assumption of like, I'm always good, you know, Mm. and I'm always worth myself. And that just changes so much of how you spend your time when you're not waking up every day, desiring to like, prove yourself to yourself to like just prove that you deserve to exist Mm. when you don't have to do that like so much energy and time like gets cleared up in your schedule right uh I'm definitely someone who has also struggled so deeply when it when it comes to like I don't even think that it's a it's a it's a confidence thing I think it's a self-respect thing because we talk a lot about Mm -hmm. love but I don't think I don't think love and and respect they they can't exist without one another. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I have learned so much about respecting myself by like what what you were saying is is being like, oh, I'm worthy and I'm allowed to I'm allowed. Like I am allocated Mm -hmm. space in this world to be able to be angry right now. Now what you do Mm -hmm. with that anger, obviously, like don't don't be harmful. But the thing is is it changes everything. Frankie, what are some practices that you use that propel this type of thought uh, of like liberation and freedom in you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the practices definitely just kind of change from day to day. But one that is always really helpful for me is like, um, I try every day to sit down and just ask myself, like, what is it like to be you today and really meet myself every single day in this moment? Because so many of us like, I think wake up every day and we're just like, well, I knew who I was yesterday. And like, or like, I, I figured out who I was when I was 18 and you're still like operating off of this, like very static version of like, this is who I am. This is what I like. This is what I need. This is how I feel when like we're changing every single day. Like being a human is like not a static experience. And so giving myself space to sit down and just be like intimate and close to the version of me that exists in this moment. That's so good. And then whatever is there if I'm tired, if I don't want to do what I said that I was going to do that day, if I like feel mad at somebody, like giving myself space to say like, okay, what's here? Like, what do I need to know? What can I care for? Mm. And of course, that doesn't mean that like, if I wake up and I I don't want to do the thing that I needed to do that day, like sometimes I can't let myself off the hook for that. And sometimes things just need to get done. And like, we live in the world we live in, and we got to be like, you know, realistic and caring towards that. But I think the space to just like, know how I actually am around that thing and give it time and give it dignity and treat who I am as somebody that's like worthy of my own attention um, just makes a huge difference with how I navigate the things that are difficult. Because if I'm going into something and I know like, I'm thinking a lot right now about doing my taxes because that's coming up. Uh, and I'm like, I think this whole system is stupid. It doesn't excite me at all. It literally doesn't even matter to me. Money isn't real. And like, (laughs) all of those are fair feelings. And I like, don't hate myself for feeling that way. And I'm still going to do my taxes, but Mm. like, I'm not going to punish myself throughout the whole process because it's difficult for me, you know? And like, when it makes me mad, I'm going to take time to be mad with it and to care for it. And like, that changes a lot of how we go through these experiences that like are facts of life and we've got to care to, but we can choose to be on our own side in the process. Yes. Oh, wow. That's so good. Asking yourself, how you can care for yourself today and who you are today. It, because we do, mm. we all live in the past and we all live in these stagnant narratives that we've been taught, which not to get Freudian, but it, in, I believe has a lot to do with the way that we were raised and, and the way that mm-hmm. our parents and not just our parents, but our parents' parents and our entire lineage of how they were taught to believe in themselves and how they were taught to parent themselves. And that's kind of what self-love is, is like learning to meet your own needs to the extent that you can and and the the needs that you can't meet you can give that to someone else and give the permission Mm -hmm. to someone else to meet those needs right and Mm -hmm. I think that it's the coolest thing I'm gonna have to start doing that with like my my like daily meditation and and body movement okay next question is you have healed so much externally right like in in your physicality is there any tools or helpful tips that you have for people who are hurting physically? Hmm. Yeah, I think that the best thing that I have for somebody that is hurting physically is just to as much as you can, in whatever way, like actually feels loving to you, 
try to make your body your friend. Mm. And it's so difficult. Like anybody who's had a chronic illness knows like it's so easy to treat your body like an enemy. Like I'm trying to live this life out here and you are screwing everything up. Like, because every time I make plans, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to follow through on them. And it's so easy to just carry so much resentment towards yourself for that. And the biggest game changer for me just came when I got the space to sit with and see like my body is only ever trying to help me. Like, and yeah, sometimes she's been given tools to try and help me that do more harm than good. And sometimes she's been taught that certain things are like unsafe that actually you know, she's like fighting battles that nobody asked her to fight. And that's causing a lot of chaos. And like, you know, there it's it, there is pain and there is confusion. And there is like frustration in the way that my body is trying to help me right now. Mm. But she is trying to help me like no part of me is out to get me. No part of me is trying to like ruin things for me. And that just opened up so much more space to like be with myself and to care for myself without just like, like, trying to like go to the doctor and do what I need while also like trying to work for like something that I hate, you know, like that just, it, it really changes the energy of how you show up when you have freedom not to like hate that in yourself. Um, and yeah, it just, it makes such a huge difference, but I definitely, I also don't talk all that much about my chronic illness journey because there's so much invalidation from a lot of people around how they talk about chronic illnesses. Mm. And sometimes my thought of like being here as somebody who's like healed and like, I I don't want it ever to come across that I'm just being like, well, if you just did all the mindset work like I did and you just like, you know, did X, Y, and Z, then you wouldn't be sick anymore either. Because I definitely don't think that like my journey was anybody's journey that my like, what was true for me has to be true for everybody. And so I think just also just giving yourself space to as much as you hear other people talking about it and you're like, that just doesn't feel loving for me right now. Like that just doesn't feel like where I'm at. Like, I don't feel like it's accessible for me right now to treat my body. Like it's a friend. I would love that. And I'm going to hold that as maybe like something I get to do in the future. But like for right now, this is where I'm at and it sucks. Like, I think there's just so much acceptance for whatever that looks like for you right now. Right. Learning to reject and accept, reject and accept old ways, Mm -hmm. new ways, old ways, new ways, and just like being willing to try, you know, being willing to be billing, being willing to being open in of itself is Mm -hmm. enough, you know, like you're enough just just for trying for waking up. And, and I personally have had, um, just like most women in our culture have, have been at war with my body my entire life, because I've been told that it's wrong or that it's not Mm -hmm. It's not enough or it's too much or, you know, whatever that is. And you might have even been the person that I learned this from on TikTok. The affirmation of I'm safe in my body. Was that you? Mm, I don't – I that's definitely something I could have said, but I don't, like, remember specifically (laughs) saying that. So It seems seems pretty in alignment with you. um, (laughs) But I've been using, you know, somewhat along those lines that that, – thought is just like I'm safe Mm -hmm. in this in this kiddo and uh she's doing her best like she's really Mm -hmm. trying today in fact she's been trying every single day for 26 years otherwise I wouldn't be here right now and learning to like find peace with that part of your body and and like you were mentioning earlier like asking questions I think is just often more important than knowing the answers to the question itself is being Mm -hmm. willing to be being willing to ask right definitely yeah and I think that's uh such a huge deal of just like having the space to have curiosity with ourselves because we were like none of us were taught to ask questions of ourselves um and a lot of our caregivers didn't do a good job of asking questions of us of like being curious about how we're doing and how we're feeling we were just kind of told like here's where you're like here's where you're going today show up to that and like don't worry too much about like how you're reacting to it and Mm so yeah it's such a huge shift to like just believe that there is something worth knowing in yourself Mm -hmm. and be willing to take the time and the space to know that thing is like a huge shift in and of itself even if the questions you ask are stupid even if you don't feel like you get answers back like it's still just the act of that is like huge and radical and worth your time wow that is so good frankie thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today i feel like i could like we you and i could probably talk for hours and hours honestly (laughs) but final question for you 
if you could tell your younger self anything today, what Frankie knows today, what would you tell your younger self? I feel like I need a second with that one. Mm. I think I would just want to tell my younger self, if I could tell my younger self anything, I would just want her to know that she's seen and that that she's valuable. That like all of the time that she spends like sitting in her room, listening to other people like fight outside the door in that space, she's still like really valuable and that her needs really matter. And that even if it's just like her like future self looking back and caring a lot, like there's a lot of care there for her. Wow. That's good. That's so good. (laughs) Do you think that she would listen? I don't know. I don't know if she would listen. I think, um, I think she would listen. I don't know how much she would believe it, but I think it would still mean something yeah. to hear it. Yeah. Well, I think that you do such a good job as uh, all of our internet big sister being able to kind of be, <laughs> like I said, kind of like a light bearer and and someone to be like, hey, like, come on, like you're gonna you're gonna be just fine, and and I can help. So. With that that in mind, Frankie, can you tell us where our listeners can can connect with you? Yes. I'm on Instagram at Frankie Doodle Dandy and TikTok at Hey Frankie Simmons. You can also just go to FrankieSimmons.com and that will direct you to all the places. I have a newsletter where I just send you a weekly love note. I have a little membership site where you can come get meditations and journaling prompts and all sorts of stuff like there's a lot of good stuff there um and I would love to yeah hang out with you yes uh and to all of our listeners uh just like a a personal testament like I said I love Frankie's content and and she is such a a pillar of self-acceptance which I think all of us could use a little bit more of especially in in these unprecedented times so (laughs) I will make sure to link all of her um connections below and thanks, Frankie. We we appreciate having you on. Um, and thank you to all of the listeners. We will see you next time on Cageless. If you enjoyed or learned anything from today's episode, I want to hear from you. Shoot me a text or call to 903-871-5092. It's completely free and anonymous if you choose. And don't forget to be kind to yourself today.